Okay, I might just get started. Oh, yeah, welcome everybody to our second seminar within the Landscapes Live seminar series. I'm Steffi Tufelde, and I'm going to share this um, seminar today together with Pierre Waller and Philip Stier. Oh, yeah, there you can see Pierre on the side. And uh, before we get started, or before I start introducing our speaker of today, Liran Gren, I'd like to give you some um, technical information. So first of all, you can find all information regarding the Landscape Live Seminar Series on the homepage that you can uh, currently see on the screen. There you'll find information on the schedule for the next weeks. You will find the links to the Zoom meetings. And also when the sessions are recorded, you can find the link to the video afterwards um, on that homepage. So the seminar today will be recorded, so the link should show up there in a few days. Um, overall, we set it up in a way that we have a the talk first, so the talk of Liran will be on the order of 30 to 40 minutes. During this talk, um, it's not possible to ask any questions, but then afterwards we have time for questions and discussions. And um, the way how you can do this, or there's actually two ways of how you can ask questions. Either you can use the chat, and the way you activate the chat is actually if you go to the bottom of your screen with your mouse, there's a symbol um, that says chat. If you click on it, a chat window comes up. The chat should be disabled now during the talk, but at the end of the talk, we will activate it, and then you can post your questions in there. And the other option that you have is raising your hand. Um, if you want to be um, speaking in life, let's say. So if you go again to the bottom of your screen, there's a symbol that says participants. If you click on that, another window comes up that shows a whole list of participants. And somewhere at the bottom of this list, there should be a small icon showing a hand. So if you click on that icon, um, your hand should come up next to your name in the list. And I think it should bring your, list, uh, your name up at the top of the list. So we can see that and basically allow you to um, unmute yourself and then you can ask your question directly to the speaker or make a comment. So both options are possible. Um, yes, so that was the technical information. So then um, I'm happy to introduce our speaker of today, Liran Goren. Uh, Liran did her undergrads at the Ben Gurion University in Israel. And she actually has two degrees, two undergrad degrees, one in geological science and one in computer science. And from there, the, she then moved to the Weizmann Institute of Science, also in Israel, for her master's, where she started to work on passive margin ductile deformation. And she stayed there for her PhD, working on pore fluid pressure in rocks. And after her PhD, she moved from Israel to Switzerland and started a postdoc at the ETH in Zurich. And there she also switched topics a little bit and started to work on landscape evolution modeling. And from Switzerland, she moved back to Israel, uh, back to Ben Gurion University, where she is now an associated professor at the Institute of Earth and Environmental Science. And um, we're happy to have you here today, Liren, and I'm passing over to, new, to you now. So we will all turn our videos off um, so that we can only see you during the talk. And at the end of your talk, um, we will, like we the moderators will turn our videos back on and moderate the question and discussion part of this seminar. Thanks cool. a lot. Thank you. So let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, can you see it properly? Yes, we can see it. Um, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to speak in front of you today and I thank the organizers for this um, quite unique opportunity, especially in these days, to share and exchange ideas and thoughts. Um, the work I will present today is the work of students and it was done with many collaborators and I will mention them by name um, throughout my talk. And it's going to be slightly more than 40 minutes. I hope it's okay. Um, so grains are basically everywhere in the landscapes that we study, from tiny clay particles to large boulders, the tile riverbeds, to um, sandbars that um, kind of control fluvial dynamics. And here we have um, a salt mantle hill slope, a beautifully exposed due to a landslide. And here we have a lunar regolite. And there are more examples, such as uh, the T layer underneath uh, fast moving glaciers and ice streams, 
or sand dunes or even asteroids. So when rains at the surface move, the surface changes and the landscape evolves. So it's clear that we should be, we should have a deep interest in grains motion. And we generally do have um, such an interest and many discoveries and models, and here I refer to conceptual models, emerge from observations of how grains move and from grain dynamics. But there are several challenges associated with grain dynamics. First of all, and this is shared with other disciplines and um, scientific and engineering disciplines that study grain dynamics, is that it's actually hard to, it's hard to understand how grains behave. And I will demonstrate that in a second. It's sometimes not intuitive and it really depends on the boundary and sometimes on the initial conditions. Second, and this is more unique to the geomorphologists that are interested in kind of large scale, long-term landscape evolution, grains are small and we can observe their, dyna their dynamics only over short time scales and small land scales. And um, so understanding their long-term effect is hard. And in fact, I'm almost not going to address this challenge in my talk today. I'm going to focus on kind of the short scale um, and uh, small scale and short term. And I have one personal challenge here. It turns out that the word granular, which I'm going to use quite a lot, is very hard for me to pronounce. Okay, so bear with me here. Okay, so grains behave in different ways depending on the boundary conditions. Sometimes they can behave as solids, for example, in this sandcastle that you see here that can sustain shear stresses. Sometimes they behave as fluid, it just flows or change their shape according to the container. And sometimes they can behave as a gaseous material that just expands if it's not confined. The issue with grains is that currently we do not have a general constitutive relation that describes their rheology. That means that we don't know how to describe the relation between the forces or the stresses exerted on the grains and the grain dynamics, their deformation or, or strain rate. And for that reason, researchers use experiments and simulations in order to study grain dynamics. And that's what I'm going to do today as well. So my talk is going to have three parts. In the first part, we are going to look at the relation between um, sediment flux and hill slope gradient in salt mantle hill slopes. And here we're going to focus only on dry grain layers. In the second part, we are going to look at a soil layer fully saturated subjected to seismic excitation, and this will have significant implications for the natural hazard of soil liquefaction. And finally, we are going to look at the possibility that seismic excitation of riverbed sediments could help mobilize very large boulders that reside on the riverbed sediments. And as the cartoons at the top um, imply, I'm going to use um, a numerical approach to study the grains. Okay, so the first part is about the relation between the sediment flux and the hillslope gradient in salt mantle hillslopes. And this is the work of a former master's student, Rand Benton. So hillslope normally grade to a local base level. It could be a river channel. And when the channel incises, the hillslope is expected to respond by erosion. And that could be either slow or fast. Okay, so hillslope are expected to erode um, over geological and even shorter time scales. Um, and today I'm going to focus only on soil mantle hill slope. That means that they are in a transport limited condition. Um, and that means that the environmental energy is invested in mobile, mobilizing uh, the mobile regolite layer. That's the layer of the grains that are available to be mobilized. Um, soil mantle hill slopes commonly reside below the angle of repose for the hill slope material. Otherwise, the hill slope material would have just fly down. And this angle of repose varies significantly between different terrains. It depends on water content, vegetation, and other cohesion agents. So if hills lie below the angle of repose, how come they erode at all? And the answer is, is that they erode with the help of environmental uh, disturbances. So energy from environmental interference to the landscape. And that could be, for example, rain splash that supply with uh, kinetic energy to individual grains, or tree fall or bioturbation. So these um, cumulatively, they help the hill slope to erode and that could be slow or fast depending on the magnitude of the forcing or in the condition of the hill slope. Commonly because of the rounded smooth shape of many hill slopes, um, it was suggested that there is a linear relation between the sediment flux and the hill slope gradient. The reason is that if you combine this law with the statement of mass conservation, 
we can reach a simple diffusion law and the, this law predicts under steady state condition a constant curvature, which is observed in many cases, but not in all cases. In other places, salt mantle hill slope do not exhibit a constant curvature, but rather the curvature tends to zero. That means that the hill slope becomes straight. Also, experiments and field observations tell us that maybe the relation between the flux and the slope is not linear. And here are just three examples. This is a sandbox experiment by Roaring, showing a nonlinear relation between the flux and the slope. Here we have um, field measurements using sediment trumps by Gabin, showing the same behavior. And here we have compilation of field data by Martin, again showing a nonlinear relation between the flux and the slope. Some of these studies put forward a particular law that describes the relation between the flux and the slope. It is commonly referred to as a nonlinear diffusion. It has a critical slope such that as the hill slope gradient approaches this critical gradient, the flux increases dramatically. And there is another coefficient here that is normally termed the nonlinear diffusion coefficient. But there's many questions still remain. For example, what is the basic relation between the sediment flux and the slope that emerge from the granular nature of the hill slope material when it is subjected to perturbations? Is it this law or maybe something else? Another question is what controls the transition between slow creep of the soil to more rapid shallow landslides? A third question is um, what is the specific effect of environmental disturbances? I mean, how does the magnitude and the frequency of the, these disturbances interfere and control the relation between the flux and the slope? So Iran in his work dealt with um, these three questions, but today for lack of time, I'm gonna focus only on the first two. Our approach is going to be to zoom in into the upper part of the hill slope where the mobile regolite layer is and represent it as a layer of grain. Now we are making very many assumptions here. For example, we ne we're neglecting cohesion and vegetation and importantly, the effect of fluid and any lateral variation uh, along the hill slope. But we imagine the hill slope to be kind of a 2D slice of grains and the slice lies on a slope with a constant angle. In terms of the boundary conditions, we have a free surface at the top. The base is made out of half grains glued together. So we have a rough immobile base representing the transition between the mobile regolite and the saprolite. And on the side, we have periodic boundaries, which means that a grain that leaves the system from one side will reappear on the other side. And that helps us uh, simulate a rather long hill slope. Um, the way that we perform the simulations is using a discrete element granular dynamics algorithm. Now, I'm sure that many of you know about this algorithm, but, but just to be complete, I'm going to very concisely describe how it works. So the model treats each grain as an individual entity, and it solves and follows the collision between the grains. So if we have two grains and they collide in the normal direction, then a normal elastic repulsive force emerged that pushed them apart. And if the collision has a shear component, then, then there is also a shear elastic component, and it can translate into frictional sliding and even rolling of the grains. Now, in each time step for each grain, we solve Newton's second law, and then we have the acceleration, the velocity, and the position of each grain. And the forces are the contact forces between the, the, the grains and the gravitational forces. There is another force here that I will mention in a second. Um, the idea is that we do not pre-describe the rheology of the layer, but it will just emerge naturally from the interactions between the grains. We use 2D rather than a 3D model in order to reduce computational complexity. And that allows us to explore extensively the parameter space. And in fact, Iran did several thousands of simulations, which is quite uncommon for granular dynamic simulations. Now, there are two special things about the simulations I'm going to show you. First of all, they are all conducted below the angle of repose for the hill slope material. So first, we find the angle of repose, and then we perform all our simulation at lower angles. At such conditions, the material does not move at all. So the second uh, special thing about the simulations is that we add another component to the force balance, and that's a force that's supposed to mimic the environmental perturbations or environmental disturbances. Okay, at this stage, we do not intend to directly mimic any particular environmental disturbance. In fact, I'm not sure that we know how to do that, 
Instead, we would like to represent them in a very general way. So the way we do that is that in each simulation, each grain in each time step fills some external force that kind of uh, triggers, could trigger some motion of the grain. This external force is random, but it's still characterized by a maximum magnitude, so a cap on the magnitude of this force, and a pseudo wavelength. And since it's random, the pseudo wavelength basically controls how frequently we change the force that the grains that the grain feels. Just to represent that, look at this time series. It represents the forces felt by two grains in two different simulations. The red line is for a short wavelength and the blue line is for a longer wavelength. It just tells you that for the longer wavelength, grains sustain the force, the same force for slightly longer. In each simulation, we have to pick the simulation parameters. So in each simulation, we set the properties of these external perturbations, so the maximum magnitude and the pseudo wavelength, and we pick the um, inclination angle of our simulation, which is below the angle of repose, as I was saying before. And in the simulation, we measure the flux and we measure the velocity profile. Now, um, here is a representative time series of the flux. We can see that the flux initially increases and then it decreases toward a pretty much steady state value. And um, I, we will report the average steady state flux since it reaches steady state. And we do the same for the velocity. Uh, we measure the velocity in each sub layer as a function of time and we average over time since the system reaches steady state conditions. Now, this model is completely non-dimensional and in order to introduce natural dimensions into the model, we have to pick some constants. So for example, if we think about quartz grains, so the density of quartz, and if the average diameter is about one millimeter and the young modulus of the grains is 50 gigapascal, then this particular simulation with two billion time steps actually corresponds only to 20 seconds in nature. And the reason is that each time step is really tiny because we have to resolve uh, the collision in between the grains. Before sharing results, I would like us to develop some expectations. Um, we need to understand what is possible for grains that sit on an inclined plane, which is the geometry that we used here. So, if we consider a layer of grains um, on an inclined plane that is tilted above the angle of repose and without perturbations, so this problem has been solved already in the mid 20th century by Bagnall. And Bagnall found uh, what is known as Bagnall rheology for this geometry, which states that the stress is related to the square of the strain rate. And if you integrate this equation, we can have the velocity profile, and in integrating the velocity, we can have the flux. Now, please don't bother yourself with these equations. They are only here to tell you that we have an analytical solution for this particular case. Bagnall's rheology predicts a concave upward velocity profile, and it predicts that the motion of the grains goes all the way to the bottom of the layer. So we have deep granular slide where all the grains participate in the motion. But what, uh, what should we expect if we want to look at a system below the angle of repose and with perturbations? So luckily, more recently, Furbish and colleagues developed a theory for such a um, situation, kind of from mesoscale consideration, um, accounting for the life expectancy of the stress chains, which are the purple lines percolating through the system and transmitting stress from the top to the bottom. And what they find is a completely different behavior. In, this, in these conditions, the velocity profile is convex upward. It basically describes creep motion of the top soil. Only the upper part of the mobile regolite participate in the motion. Okay, now that we have expectation, let look, let's look at some results. We are looking here at a series of simulations. So each symbol here is a single simulation and we're looking at the flux as a function of the slope. And all these simulations are conducted with the same layer of grains so same external uh, maximum magnitude and wavelength and same number of grains, just tilted at a different angle. And what we see is a nonlinear relation between the flux and the slope, which is nice because a nonlinear relation has been observed in experiments and in the field. But if we try to fit the nonlinear diffusion law that we've seen previously, then although our square looks okay, we see that the residual has a structure. So that's probably not the correct physics. Uh, alternatively, we can fit this nonlinear diffusion law, that's the green line here, 
to the low and intermediate inclination angles, and we can fit back angle relative to the top to the high angles. And then the fit is really good. But then we should ask ourselves, why does it make sense to fit two different rheologies to a single simulation set with the same grains, the same conditions? The only difference is a different angle, all of them below the angle of repose. So to start answering, to, to try and answer this question, let's look at the velocity profile. Now here, each dotted line represents the average velocity profile for a single simulation in different angles. And we see the same behavior. So at low angles, we have a convex upward velocity profile. And as we propagate toward the high angles, we see a shift toward a concave upward velocity profile. So here as well, we see a transition between two different dynamics, creep motion at low angles and deep bagnol slides at high angles. But I want to remind you that all the simulations are done below the angle of repose. And that means that the perturbations introduce an effective lower angle of repose that allows for deep slides to develop in a situation that uh, would not allow it otherwise. Let's look at some movies, that's always nice. On the left hand side, we are looking at a simulation at, uh, conducted at 13 degrees, and that's representative of the creep motion. So you can see the color code correspond here to the velocity, and you can see that only the top grains um, are really significant, right? The white is grains that do not move. And if we tilt the same layer to an angle of 15.5 degree, degrees, we see a completely different dynamics, right? The whole layer participates in the motion, and the motion is much faster. So very distinct behaviors. What happens is the transition between the creep and the slide? So here at the top panel, we're looking at a flux time series for a simulation, which is at 15 degrees, which is exactly the transition between the two regimes. And now we are going to look at the velocity profile, but not average through time, but the instantaneous velocity profile. And we see that the flux curve has ups and downs. And first, we're looking at the velocity profile when the flux is high. So that's the instantaneous. And we can see that we have a concave upward velocity profile. So a landslide. And for the same simulation, if we look at the velocity profile where, this, where the flux is low, we see a convex upward velocity profile. So the transition between the two regimes is actually a temporal one. We don't have an intermediate regime, but we have a simulation where sometimes we, um, for in the same simulation, sometimes we have sliding and sometimes we have creep motion. Okay, so to summarize, to summarize this part, we've seen that for a dry granular, um, for a dry layer of grains, uh, we observe a nonlinear relation between the flux and the slope. And this nonlinearity emerges from the creep motion and from the landsliding separately, but importantly from the transition between them. We also saw that we can get deep granular slide below the angle of repose. And that's because the external perturbations effectively reduce the angle of repose. And in this regime, all the grains participate in the motion. And for natural hill slope, that might expose the bedrock under uh, the mobile regolite layer. OK, I would like to move to the next part that deals with soil liquefaction. And this is the work of a PhD student, Shachar Ben Zeev, at the Hebrew University, and colleagues, Inata Arono, Brenna Tussaud, and Standard Perez. So, soil liquefaction is a natural hazard associated with earthquakes. It occurs during or immediately after an earthquake. And the idea with soil liquefaction, the way we understand it, is that it represents a phase transition of the soil from a solid that can sustain shear stresses and the stresses uh, that it feels due to the infrastructure that is rooted in the soil. It undergoes a phase transition and it transition into a fluid that just flows in response to any shear stress because it cannot sustain shear stresses. And what people see in the field during soil liquefaction is actually uh, quite devastating. People see that building collapse and tilt, buried infrastructure sometimes flow, the ground settle, and in many cases, these phenomena are accompanied by observations of fluid that escape out of the surface, sometimes carrying with it grains, and we can see these um, cute uh, sand volcanoes. In the lab to study soil liquefaction, people commonly take a layer of grains, most commonly in an undrained condition, and they shake it as if it fills a seismic excitation. And they look at different properties. For example, at the top figure here, we look at what is called hysteresis loops. The y-axis is stress, the x-axis is strain, and we look at the relation between the stress and the strain. 
And this is the beginning of the shaking. We see, uh, we see high stresses and almost no strain. And then gradually we can have more and more strain for the same amount of stress. So the system kinds of lose its, its, its resistance to motion and it can be formed extensively. Another experimental observation is that sometimes people can measure the core pressure within their experimental device and they follow the pressure increase. And the reason for that is that the way we understand liquefaction is that it closely uh, related to the increase of core pressure in the pore space. Because when you shake a layer of grains, then the grains would like to compact, but there is pore fluid in the pore space. So the grains attempt to compact, kind of pushes on the fluid, and because of its low compressibility, the fluid pressure increases significantly, uh, reduces the effective stress, and reduces the shear resistance causing the phase transition between solid and fluid. The classical mechanism of liquefaction, the way most people envision it, is that um, it occurs under undrained conditions. The reason is that um, people think that when you compact the grains, then you have to trap the fluid in the pore space. And when it is trapped and cannot escape, its pressure can increase. And that's really the common perception that guides many experiments. Um, here are just two examples. Let's focus on the right-hand side. This is from a National Academy of Sciences report, and they basically say that um, soil liquefaction is associated with undrained soil response. But is this really the case? Let's look at two YouTube movies. This is always fun, okay? So the first movie is from the Tahoko earthquake in Japan, 2011. And um, let me go forward a bit. Uh, we will focus on the pavement and you will see that the pavement shifts as if it's on a fluid. Let me uh, forward a bit more. Just a second. Where are we? Okay, we see the pavement again. And now the camera, soon the camera will rotate to the other side. And we are going to see fluid escaping out of the ground. And this occurs, here it is, this occurs during the earthquake. So that's not post earthquake. It, it's occurred while seismic excitation shakes the ground. So we have lots of fluid coming out of the ground. So it feels like during the earthquake, the, the soil and the whole system behaves in a more drained uh, condition because fluid can escape um, quite easily. Let's look at, an, at another video. Uh, this comes from an educational demonstration, which is quite common. And we have here a bucket with saturated soil and a, and a yellow bus. And what's going to happen is that they're going to hit the bucket with a hammer. And let's move just a bit forward. And the thing to observe is that while they're hitting the bucket with the hammer, then the grains and the fluid kind of change places. So, so the grains settle and the fluid go upward. And during the time that the fluid goes upward, the bus sinks. So we have liquefaction under fully drained conditions. Um, and that's quite common to many educational videos that you can find on YouTube. So what is it? Um, are undrained conditions really necessary? So we need to answer two questions here. First of all, how should we understand on, or define the drainage conditions of soils? And second, is it possible to initiate soil liquefaction under well-drained conditions? To start addressing the first question, let's, um, let's look at some theory first. So I have here four equations. Let me quickly describe them to you. The first two equations are mass conservation statement for the grains and for the fluid. So the grain skeleton of the soil and for the fluid that is uh, in the pore space. The third equation is Darcilo, and the fourth equation is a state equation for a compressible fluid. Now, if you combine these four, equ these four equations, we can reach a rather simple three terms equation. Um, and to do that, we have to make several assumptions. For example, we assume that um, the uh, fluid is more compressible than the grains, which makes sense for water and quartz grains, for example. I want to show you this, this equation in a non-dimensional form and explain it a bit. So we have here three terms. We have here the temporal derivative of the pressure. We have here a diffusion term that depends on the permeability. And we have here a term that depends on the divergence of the grain velocity. How does it work exactly? If we have a compacting layer, 
then the divergence is negative and that causes the pore fluid to increase in its pressure and to, for the fluid to try and escape from the compacting pore. And if we have a dilating system, so this divergence is positive, that causes a reduction of the pore pressure and it sucks fluid uh, back in. Now, this equation is controlled by a single non-dimensional number that is called the Bora number. Now, the De Boer number is known from a uh, viscoelastic uh, theory, but here it can be expressed as a ratio of two timescales. So there is the pore pressure diffusion timescales, where pore pressure diffusion is assisted simply by fluid flow. Uh, and that depends on the permeability, on the fluid compressibility, on the fluid viscosity, and on the distance to the drain boundary. And so that's the ratio between the diffusion timescale and the forcing timescale which is the time scale of observation, meaning it could be the whole earthquake or just a single peer, period out of the earthquake. Now, if the De Boer number is very high, that means the diffusion time scale is really large, then fluid cannot escape from compacting pore that easily and the system behaves in an undrained manner, okay? And the diffusion term becomes negligible. But if the De Boer number is really small, that means that the diffusion time scale is really small, then the diffusion control the dynamics. So the fluid can escape within the time scale of deformation. And for this regime, it we can show that the pressure um, is proportional to the temporal derivative of the porosity. So to the rate at which pore space increase and collapse. This um, schematic graph shows you the De Boer number um, as a function of different parameters. So on the y-axis, we have a the depth of the soil, so the distance from the surface assumed to be drained. And on the x-axis, we have the logarithm of the permeability. And the color corresponds to the De Boer number. And when we have uh, red and orange and yellow colors, that means that the De Boer number is high and the system behaves in an undrained manner. But the green and blue colors represent situation where the De Boer number is actually low and the system should behave in a well-drained uh, manner. And that's a non-negligible area in this, in this phase diagram. And in fact, we should expect that there should be many soils that behave in a well-drained manner. So it's actually important to understand whether such soils can liquefy. To try to test for that, we are going to um, use a coupled grain fluid model. So we are taking the grain dynamics model that I showed you before. We are adding two additional forces. One of them is a buoyancy force due to the fluid, and the other one is a force that depends on the fluid pressure gradient. That's kind of a seepage force. When the fluid experiences pressure gradient, then it flows and it can drag the grains with it. Um, so over the grain dynamics model, we have an Eulerian grid, and over this grid, we solve the equation for the fluid pressure. And the two phases are fully coupled because in order to know the permeability and the porosity in each time step and also the grain velocity, we have to interpolate information from the grain layer to the fluid layer. And also in order to know the magnitude of this uh, pressure gradient force, we have to interpolate from the fluid layer to the grain layer. So the two phases are fully coupled. Okay, that's the simulation setup that we are using. We have a layer of grain. Uh, at the top, we have um, a free surface, and that's also where the water table is. And the pressure is set to be zero. That means that it's completely drained. Fluid can easily escape outside. And the base is assumed to be impermeable. So fluid cannot flow inward, in, into, the, into the layer. And we have here periodic boundary conditions as before. Now, um, the system is subjected to um, cyclic horizontal uh, shearing with a predefined amplitude and frequency. And it's controlled by two non-dimensional numbers. First of all, the um, scaled acceleration, which is the horizontal acceleration with respect to the gravitational acceleration. And we uh, perform simulations with different values here. And the second value is the De Boer number that we just discussed. And in order to study liquefaction, the possibility of liquefaction under drain conditions, we use a very small De Boer number of 10 to the minus, of around 10 to the minus three. So the diffusion time scale is really short and fluid can easily escape um, to the drain surface. Let's, let, let's start looking at some simulation results. First of all, we are looking at the compaction and the settlement of the grains. So in the y-axis, we have the change in the porosity and here we have the time. And we see two different regimes. 
for um, low acceleration, uh, we have almost no response. When, when the acceleration becomes higher than 0.15 g, we see significant settlement, and in fact, we see a linear settlement, which we, we are going to explain in a second. Another observation is that at some stage, the shear waves that propagate from the base that is sheared to the top disappear. I want, you, I want to show you that in a movie. Let's see if it's gonna work. Okay, let me propagate a bit forward. So, okay, I'm gonna go a bit backward. Okay, so at the beginning, by the way, uh, the color code corresponds to the um, solid stresses in between the grains. The arrows represent the instantaneous velocity of the grain. The blue arrow represents it's, it's a magnified imposed velocity. It's not to scale the blue arrow. And we can see at the beginning that shear waves propagate all the way from the base to the top. So all the grains shear in response to the base shearing. But then suddenly, the top layer, in the top layer, shear waves cannot propagate through it. Um, so it, it behaves as a fluid, and we almost don't see any stress chains that percolate through it. So at the base, we have a layer that behaves in a solid way where shear waves can pass through it. And then at the top, it's free of shear waves. So there is a front in between these two sublayers, and this front propagates upward with time. So gradually it takes over the sediment layer, and you will soon see that the layer establishes back its kind of solid properties, and now shear waves can propagate throughout the layer again. So transiently, the layer was liquefied because shear waves could not pass through it. So that's what we saw. We saw a stage where we have shear waves, and then they disappear in the top layer, and then there, there is a front separating between the solid and the fluid-like layers, and this front propagates upward. Okay, two more observations. We also measure the pore pressure in the system, and this is a measurement of the pore pressure at different depths. That's at the top, center, and the base, and the dashed line here represents the lithostatic stress. So when the pore pressure approaches the lithostatic stress, the system, by definition, should be liquefied. And we see that it occurs in almost all depth. And as we go to the top, it occurs over a longer duration. And the final observation relates to these hysteresis loops we were looking at before, the relation between the stress and the strain. And here, the color code corresponds to the timing within the simulation. So white is the beginning of the simulation, and black is the end. And at the very beginning, we have, we're looking at this loop, okay? So we are, seeing, we are seeing a lot of stress, and then we move to the yellow loops, and we see the same amount of strain, but almost no stress, okay? So we have deformation, but there is no stress that induces it. So the system kind of liquefies in response. It cannot resist, it does not um, transmit stresses. So these four observations basically indicate that the system that we've experimented with has been liquefied and it was done on, uh, under extremely drained conditions. And that's the way that we understand the physics that gov uh, that's governing the behavior. There is a beautiful coupling between grain settlement and the pressure gradients within the system. So as grains start to settle, then the fluid wants to escape and it generates pressure gradients so that it can flow up. And the faster the grain settle, the greater is the pressure gradient, but there is a limit, and the limit is the lithostatic gradient. So once the pressure gradient reaches lithostatic gradient, then the grain settle at constant velocity, and that results in the uh, linear compaction curve that we've seen previously. But there's also a volume restriction, because the grains that settle eventually reach the base, and they accumulate over the base, and that creates the front. So the, at the base, the grains are already settled, and they regain their contact forces and transmit shear stresses. And as more and more grain um, sediment, basically, we have the front propagates upward. Now, this compaction front, or sometimes called solidification front, is actually known from uh, consolidation theory. But here we show that it emerges naturally when you shear a layer of grains. And this, the duration of the compaction front propagation basically controls the duration of liquefaction. So what, what did we see so far? We saw that there are actually two pathways to, for liquefaction. There is the classical undrained pathway, where the system is undrained and you try to compact it and the pressure increases and it loses its shear resistance. And there is the drain pathway, where you have a system 
a new shear rate, and then it wants to compact. So the fluid tries to escape upward, and it supports the grain, uh, and uh, contact force vanish, and the system again behaves as a liquid. So we've seen the drainage conditions during the earthquake can be expressed as a competition between the diffusion time scale and the uh, per earthquake periodicity. And we've seen that drain liquefaction can occur, um, or we saw hints for that, and, it, and it's associated with the compaction frame from that propagates upward. Okay, I want to move to the third part of my talk, and don't worry, it's gonna be the shortest. So um, I'm moving to rivers now. And when we look at rivers, um, especially in high mountainous rains, sometimes we see very large boulders that reside on the riverbed. And these boulders are believed to be derived from the local steep hill slopes, or sometimes they might come from upstream in the river. And how do we know that? For example, in this beautiful picture uh, from the Liu River in Taiwan, we see nice boulders within a marble gorge. Here is another example. This is the hydropower dam in the Botakoshi River in Nepal, and this is a picture by Kristen Cook. And this um, river has endured a glacial lake outburst flood in 2016, and uh, Cook et al. report on this um, event in a paper in 2018. That's how the hydropower dam looks after the uh, extreme flood, and we see lots of large boulders behind the dam. And actually, Christine uh, uh, told me that when they started excavating the sediments behind the dam, they found a 40 meter boulder that was not there before. So it was, was mobilized during the extreme flood. I want to show you another example, a more, uh, this is from um, a paper currently in discussion in ESERF by Huber et al. And they reviewed many very large boulders within or close to a river system, again in Nepal. And they looked at and they dated the boulders and they estimated the discharge needed in order to mobilize them. And that's actually the largest boulder that they looked at. It's almost 30 meters in diameter. And according to its lithology, the authors estimated that it travels probably tens of kilometers. And they estimated that the discharge needed in order to mobilize it is of the order of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 meter cube per second. And that's enormous. Of course, that's not normal discharge in the river. And it can occur when you have kind of a, a dammed lake outburst flood. Um, just to give you an order of magnitude, the glacial lake outburst flood that was reported in Cook et al. is by a half to one order of magnitude smaller than that. It doesn't mean that such floods cannot occur. They can occur, but they are probably quite rare. But the question that I want to ask here is whether there is another mechanism with short return period that could be responsible for the mobilization of very large boulders over bedrock rivers in tectonically active regions. This is not to say that these boulders were not mobilized in these very extreme floods. We just want to consider that maybe there are other possibilities. So I would like here to offer that maybe the boulder moves when the riverbed sediments liquefy. Why does it make sense? In fact, riverbed sediments should be prone for liquefaction. These are very young sediments, extremely loosely um, packed. And as we've seen previously, the fact that they are probably well-drained should not prohibit liquefaction here. So the idea is that maybe seismic excitation due to an earthquake, or in fact, due to um, glacial lake outburst can induce this liquefaction. And here, I'm referring to reports in Cook et al that um, showed that the flood itself generated a significant seismic signal. So the idea here is that the um, riverbed sediment experienced seismic shaking at the base. And then, as we've seen previously, the pressure increases and the fluid tries to escape and it supports the boulder that then can move downstream. Okay, as a proof of concept, I want to show you uh, another YouTube movie. It's from um, an event, a 2018 uh, earthquake in Palu, Indonesia. And what happened here is that the soil liquefied and um, it's a very shallow slope of one degree. And because it liquefies, it started sliding down slope over a very, very shallow slope of one degree. Okay, it's, and you can see that as the material flows down, it carries with it everything that is on top of it. So building, fields, infrastructure, um, it seems like there should be no problem to carry down a slope also a boulder. 
So that's what we're going to test. We are going to use the same setting as we've looked at before. Um, but now we are going to add a big boulder at the top. Um, so we shake, oh, okay, as before, um, we shake the system. It's a drain system that the bore number is significantly smaller than one, and the pore fluid can easily escape from the top. Uh, the layer is tilted at a small angle of two degrees, and we shake it with an amplitude of five millimeter and five millimeters and frequency of four hertz. So the peak run acceleration here is 0.32 G. I'm going to show you now two uh, simulations. On the left hand side, that's the setting that I just described. It's a wet setting. And here we have a dry setting. So no fluid in between the grains, but the PGA is even larger. Okay? So um, if you look first on the right hand side, you will see that actually nothing happens. I mean, there is shaking, but the boulder almost it almost doesn't move, and that's why we stop the simulation quite fast. But then on the left-hand side, the wet system with the slightly lower PGA, we see that the boulder moves significantly. Actually, it moves down slope and into the layer. The reason that it moves into the sediment is because although it is made out of the same lithology as the, as the grains around it, it has a higher specific weight because for the same volume here, we also have the corrosion. Let me start the movie again, and I want you to pay attention to the fact that not only the boulder moves, but in fact, all the sediments around it moves. So in a way, the boulder is kind of a marker for the mobilization of the sediment grains during this um, riverbed liquefaction event. Um, here we're looking at the trajectories of the boulder and grains around it. So the boulder is in bold, and we can in fact see that all the grains, these are just random grains that I picked. Uh, sorry, the blue is the blue is the beginning of the simulation and red is the end of the simulation. So we see the position of different grains at different times. And we see again that not only the boulder moves, but also other grains move and some of them move even to a greater distance. Here, for example, we have a grain that goes also upward. It switches places with the boulder, but this motion decays as we go um, down and deep into the layer. Now, since we saw that the, in, the drain, in the dry system nothing happens, we should speculate that this behavior is due to uh, the fluid effect within the pore space and possibly due to liquefaction or at least transient liquefaction of um, the drain grain layer. But to establish that, let, let's look at the next figure. Here at the top panel, we have the forcing, okay? So that's the, that represents the uh, horizontal shaking. And here we have kind of a complicated um, figure. Let me explain that to you. We have on the y-axis the depth, and on the x-axis we have the time. And each pixel in the figure represents the pore pressure averaged over a particular slice at a certain depth and at a certain time. The blue color corresponds to cases where the scale pore pressure, so the pore pressure uh, with respect to the effective initial lithostatic stress, is lower than one, so not liquefied. And the green corresponds to uh, position and times where uh, the pore pressure is high. And this position does not, is fully supported by the high pore pressure. The yellow line represents the vertical trajectory of the boulder. Now, if we zoom in, we can see that the motion of the boulder is um, associated with liquefaction and non-liquefaction, with this transient liquefaction event. Because during the blue periods where the pore pressure is low, the boulder does not move and it moves only during these uh, green periods where the pore pressure increases and supports the weight of the grains so the grains can just slide down. Okay, so to summarize this part, we've seen that um, during riverbed liquefaction, the upper layer of the bed can move downstream. We've seen that large boulders that are partly or fully submerged within the riverbed sediments could be advected together with the riverbed sediments. And we've seen that the boulder tends to sink into the bed. And maybe that could be an indicative observation that tells us that uh, we, uh, the process that occurred here is mobilization by riverbed liquefaction. A yet unexplored idea is to combine this seismic excitation with the extreme flood conditions of the glacial lake Argus flood. And that we still haven't done. It's probably quite complicated. And um, now I have a request for you. If you ever observed a river sediment during an earthquake, I would really be interested to hear about that because um, I couldn't find anything in the literature about the possibility of liquefaction of riverbed sediments. Okay, to summarize my whole talk, 
I um, kind of take home or take office messages, um, depending where you work currently, we've seen that grains build a significant fraction of the Earth's surface. And, the gra and grain dynamics matters. It dictates the stress conditions and the kinematics of the surface and how the surface responds to external forces uh, of various types and magnitudes. We've also seen that granular dynamics model, whether wet or dry, um, are important in shaping our intuition in terms of what processes are possible, what can we anticipate, what controls landscape evolution. They also tell us about um, the important parameters and the relevant lens and timescales. Um, that's it, and while you think about questions, let me hypnotize you with a, um, uh, with a movie of waves uh, approaching the shore. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Liren, for the really nice talk. So now we have uh, some time for questions or discussions or stories about how you observed uh, liquefaction and riverbed sediments that you want to share. Um, so as I said in the beginning, you basically have two options now of um, asking questions or making comments. You can either um, write them in the chat and the chat can be activated at the bottom of your screen. Um, there's the small icon that says chat. You have to click on it and the chat uh, window will open and the chat is activated now. Um, or the other option is that you click on the list with participants and at the bottom of this list, I think probably on the left hand side, there should be an icon with a hand. And if you click on that icon, we should be able to see that you are raising your hand and um, you can then unmute your microphone and ask the question directly. So we welcome questions and comments now. Okay. So there's a question, I might just read it out um, in case people don't see the chat. Hi Lira, nice talk. In the first part of the talk, did the temporal change in behavior of velocity profiles with constant slope correspond to the perturbations in external forcing? Um, by George. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we didn't observe anything. Um, we, we didn't observe such a correlation. In fact, in each time step, different grains experience different forces. So, and the distribution of the forces should be um, pretty much constant at different time steps. So I wouldn't expect it to be the case. I think that this is just a behavior that emerges um, from um, kind of crazy and random grain dynamics. Okay, should I just continue, Philip, Peter? I can uh, maybe ask the... Uh... <laughs> So there is another question by uh, Simon Mudd. Uh, so great uh, talk, uh, Liran. Two questions. Uh, you boulder sink into finer sediments. Do you know of any uh, GPR or other geophysical observation that have found uh, big clasts buried after floods? So this is the first question. Or maybe in the sed sedimentary records, is there is some evidence for some large boulders that are uh, buried? Um, and second question, did you test the sensitivity of the boulder sinking uh, process to the depths uh, of the layer of the grains? Mm -hmm. Okay, so as for the first question, so in fact, I don't really know about any geophysical observations uh, about that, um, except for what I told you at the beginning, what Christian Cook told me, that um, the large boulder during the, um, was kind of buried under um, smaller sediments after the glacial uh, lake outburst flood in the Botokoshi river. Um, there is, um, there might be something that corresponds to that in the geological record in Switzerland. I cannot accurately cite it, but the idea that there might have been some kind of liquefaction induced by a very big landslide that hit um, a river valley, a very big river valley, and then apparently boulders, the interpretation is that kind of boulders floated around to different places. Some of them even went upstream. And today you can find them buried within sediments. I don't, I'm not sure that it corresponds exactly to the process that I was describing. 
I can tell you that in the Liu River in Taiwan, um, some of the boulders that um, we see are almost completely covered by sediments. But it doesn't mean, I mean, it doesn't mean since we haven't seen them um, arriving to their position, it doesn't mean that they, it occurred by uh, liquefaction of the riverbed. Maybe, maybe they were in place and later covered by sediment. So these are probably hard, um, hard observations to make. I think we should, I, I, I mean, I'm really eager to hear about in situ observations during um, an earthquake or a flood uh, where a boulder that was not there before is suddenly found in a certain position. Okay, I get the, the oh, next. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't yeah. answer the second question about the yeah. sensitivity of the boulder sinking. So um, basically, the um, the boulder should sink all the way down because that's the equilibrium position for it. Because um, its specific density is larger than that of the environment. Um, so, I mean, uh, we didn't continue the simulation for that long because this particular simulation that I showed you actually took a week. Or so. I mean, quite impatient, um, but it should go all the way uh, down. Yeah, sorry, now I'm done. Okay. The, the next question is from uh, Eric Lajeunesse. So he said, like, uh, dearly one, thank you for the very nice talk. The question is about the hill slope part of your talk. So then it's a bit technical. I hope I, I don't make any mistake. Uh, so use Magnod on Furbish rheology, but didn't did not you try to use the so-called mu of i rheology developed by Pulikon and collaborators? Does this rheology fail to capture the behavior of his law? Okay, so in fact, Bagnold's rheology, it can be shown that mu of i is like Bagnold's rheology. So i is a non-dimensional number that normally being, is, is used to characterize uh, the dynamics of grain layers, and it scales um, the stress with the square of the strain rate, or actually the opposite, this, the strain rate with the square root of the stress. Okay? So in fact, the mu of i rheology and Bagnall's prediction corresponds to each other. And that's what we observe um, at the higher angles. Okay. I can maybe ask uh, the next question by uh, Rebecca Hodge. So basically, uh, a question is about the effect of uh, external forcings on uh, on the uh, mobility of hill slopes. And so our question is, um, uh, in the first, pass, first part of your talk, the forcing was applied only to, uh, sorry, the forcing was applied to all grains, but many of the processes that you refer to would affect surface grains more than once at depths. So would you get the same results if you varied the perturbation by elevation? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great talk. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, we, we didn't try that. I can tell you that the response, although, um, although the same kind of a force scheme was applied to grains at different depth, the response of the grains was different because grains at the top that endure less um, lithostatic stress can more easily be mobilized. And we think that what, what's happening is that when the top grains move, then they kind of relieve some of the stresses from the lower grains and then the lower grains can also move. But I think that that's an, that's, I mean, that's an important and valid point, that different environmental disturbances have a different structure of, um, that, that affects the grain layer. So for example, something that comes from the top should affect more the surface grains, but maybe tree fall have a, a structure that is more localized some, at some depth, and we didn't explore that. Okay, I might actually use this opportunity before I read out the next question <laughs> to ask a question myself, because it's a bit of a follow up. Um, also regarding the first part of your talk. Um, have you ever tried to vary the grain size distribution within your model? Because at least it looked like that the grains all had the same size in, in the model that you showed on I think slide 13 or so. But yeah. in reality, we probably have a, yeah, a gradient having coarser grains and the in the bottom or towards the bottom. Um, have you tried to rerun the model with grain size variability or not yet? And if you have done so, do you think it actually matters? Would it change the results? Um, okay, so we haven't tried that. The, grain, um, the grains are not, uh, do not have a uniform uh, size. 
they are they have different sizes but the distribution is really narrow it's kind of they have an average of one and then the distribution is between 1.2 and 0.8. Um, it's because of numerical difficulties, because the time step depends on the smallest grain. So once you introduce the small grains, everything becomes much uh, slower in the simulation. I think that's, um, again, a very important point and uh, should be explored, but we haven't done that um, so far. Um, I, I, I find it hard to speculate whether it should have a significant effect on the rheology that we observe. I don't know. Okay, then we wait for, <laughs> for the results once you do it. <laughs> okay, so the next question is by Hugh Sinclair. Uh, he says, fascinating talk, thank you. Many of your experiments incorporate stress chains between elements. Do you think irregular clustered elements rather than rounded elements would impact the results significantly? Um, yeah, again, some questions. Uh, there are um, people are doing uh, discrete element simulations with random shaped grains. It's a bit harder to do, it takes longer. We haven't done that. I suspect that for the coupled system where with grains and fluid, I'm not sure it will influence significantly the system because what we see is once liquefaction initiates, then contact forces tends to disappear and the dynamics is controlled by the properties of the fluid. So by the permeability and the viscosity of the fluid, unless we don't see stress chains, at least at the liquefied layer. Um, there could be some interesting effects, for example, if we have weird shaped grains, maybe they can trap uh, fluid in between two grains that compacts more easily, so we can have maybe a combination of the grain and ungrained response. Um, but we haven't done that so far. Okay, I, I take the next question, um, which is from Anne Voglander. So she wrote, hi, Luan, thanks a lot for this talk. I would have a question on the false chains, which seems to appear in your simulation. Those these emerging structures, arches and chains have an effect uh, for example, toughening greater rigidity, and can you quantify the stress at which they disappear or they break? Okay, so these stress chains, they always appear in granular dynamic simulations because um, uh, these this stress chains that percolate from top to bottom and also to the sides is what supports the layer. They transmit the stresses, the lithostatic stresses from top to bottom. Um, now, they emerge naturally. Um, and they disappear when the fluid pressure is sufficiently high. So when the fluid pressure is sufficiently high, the fluid is the one that supports the weight of the grains on top of it. And then the stress chains disappear or break, or they become very local and they do not fully percolate from the top to the bottom. Um, in terms of the stresses that at which they disappear. I don't know uh, if Anne refers to the fluid pressure at which they disappear. And then there is, if that's the case, then there is um, a, a gradual transition because the higher the fluid pressure, the smaller are the contact forces in between the grains and the less significant are the stress chains. So there is a gradual transition between fully stress chain supported to fluid pressure supported. I hope that answers your question. I hope to. Yeah, any other question from the audience? Well, I, ha I have one which is a bit more general, but uh, also from, from observation. So in all your simulations, when you have shaking from, from earthquakes, or you, all the gr you show that all the grain um, layer is moving and the grains are, are really uh, all disturbed. Some are coming up, coming down. But in some of uh, observations that we see in, in, um, in sediment layers, we often see some uh, injection dikes uh, associated to the earthquakes. Do you think this is something that can uh, occur based on like a pre-earthquake, some fracturing, et cetera, or is it something that can also emerge in certain conditions if the layer is homogeneous? Um, 
So um, I think that this, um, this kind of um, dynamic hydrofactoring, a precondition for it to occur is to have some cohesion to begin with. So to have some kind of tensile strength for the layer, and then you have the ability to crack it. Um, it it's actually possible to do that in grain scale simulations, and people do add cohesion. And um, we, we still haven't, haven't done that, but um, we might be able to mimic this behavior if we have layer, layers with different permeability. And then maybe when we have kind of a cap layer with lower permeability, then the fluid pressure, if fluid pressure is generated below the layer, maybe it will choose to be injected um, locally and not in a distributive manner. And that might uh, look like an injection dive. But um, I think that cohesion is really a precondition for these uh, um, features to form. Thank you, thanks. Okay, this another question just came up um, in the chat. So again, from Eric Lajeunesse. Just a quick question. What are the boundary conditions at the base of your granular, granular, granular layer? So I see I have the same trouble here. No slip. And to what extent do they influence the results? Okay, so at the base, in all the simulation, we have a base wall, we have a, a wall at the base, and we have half grains that are glued to the walls. And they cannot move, and, and the bottom wall moves as a, as a single unit. And then there is shearing in between this rough wall to the grains on top of it. So it's, it's, um, I think it's important that it's rough. Otherwise, um, it will be harder to transmit stresses upward. Um, and generally, the, the properties of the, of the, of the base um, has been shown to be very significant for the results of, um, of discrete element simulation. So uh, people have done um, even experiments with different bases, sometimes very smooth and sometimes um, rougher, I mean, sometimes even on over fabrics. And it, it has a significant effect on the um, injection of energy into the grain layer. Okay, um, is there any, anybody who wants to ask another question? I will, uh, I will ask one. Um, so, Liran, if I understood correctly, you only consider some uh, elastic interaction between your grains. So, I'm, or maybe some frictional one as well. So, I'm wondering what happens if you consider some plastic interaction between grains. Is it going to change the, the results and how it will uh, impact the results? Yeah, so there, there is some plasticity in the sense that there is dissipation of energy when grains collapse. It's kind of a spring dashboard model uh, in between the grains. And you can play with that to decide how much elastic are the collisions. And um, I mean, it, it, it changes the grain dynamics. It, I, we didn't explore it extensively in these simulations, but um, there are many papers that, that, that look at the effect of them, kind of changing the relative magnitude of the elastic and the viscous component. Um, so we have kind of the, this um, uh, elastoplastic component of the collision, and then when grains shear, uh, when elastic shear emerges, if the shear stresses surpasses some threshold, then sliding starts to occur over the contact. And we also account for the torque balance, so that could result in, in rolling of grains uh, one on top of the other. And that's actually very important that that, because the rolling dictates the apparent friction of the grain layer. So we set a surface friction in between the grains to be 0.5, for example, but the actual friction that we measure is much lower because the, the formation can also occur by volume that, reduces, that occurs at lower stress. Yeah, I'm telling you many things that you didn't ask, just pouring information. Okay, so there's no more question in the chat. So I'm seeing a hand symbol, but I think it is a clapping hand and not a raising your hand, uh, if I'm correct. So I can, so I just ask the person to unmute in case the person wants to ask a question, but if not, we just see it as a clapping hand from the audience. <laughs> 
yeah, I think it wasn't a question. Okay, then um, we would like to thank you very much again, Leon, for this really nice talk. And also thanks to the audience for asking questions. And then um, I hope to see many of you again next week at 4 p.m. for our next seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.